Hi, welcome to Flight Test. I'm Eric, and this is Josh. Hi. And this is also Josh. We were invited today into the home of Josh and Hope Finn, and Josh has a pretty unique hobby. There's lots of times when we start our airplane builds yeah. on our kitchen tables, but we never get to test fly our airplanes inside of our house. How did you get into this? This is such a unique and, and amazing thing. I come from three generations of aviators, and so model aviation has been a part of my life. My grandfather flew models back in the 30s growing up, mm -hmm. and then he passed on that love to my dad. My dad flew model rockets. He never got into the model planes a whole lot, but into the rockets. Through my involvement in rocketry, because my dad fully corrupted me into that that whole world, I discovered this by accident doing research on the internet on model airplanes when I was about 12 years old. So what is this called exactly? This is called indoor free flight. At the time, I didn't even know it was called that. All I knew was I saw that somebody had gotten a rubber band powered airplane to fly for more than a minute, and I couldn't believe that. So I had to know more. And then I found out, oh, that's a short flight. Just a year before that, somebody had broken the hour mark with an indoor model airplane in a, in a dirigible hangar. So history was being made at that time. And you had to be and, a part of that. And I said, <laughs> yes, I have got to do that. So these are called F1D, right? The crazy thing over there is an F1D, and that is currently the pinnacle of worldwide competition models for indoor flying. So what type of flight times can you expect from an F1D? This guy can fly for roughly half an hour under optimal conditions and in the hands of someone who's very experienced. That's kind of the top end performance there. That's not the top end performance of ultimate indoor models, but for uh, world recognized classes, that's kind of the top end. The penny planes, we have seen someone actually unofficially break 20 minutes in, a, in an aircraft hangar some years back. Uh, typical flight times, though, you're going to see somewhere be between 10 and 15 minutes. Still longer than most RC airplanes sure. when you're guiding them and flying them. So that, that's really incredible. And the ingenuity, although these you know, the structures seem incredibly simple, there's an immense amount of ingenuity and the materials that go into it and the selection of the materials. Uh, tell us, first of all, um, this clear covering, what is it? This is a polyester film. It's called polymicrofilm. That's okay. what it's marketed as. And the reason for that name is it was a plastic replacement for the old microfilm. And the difference is I can touch this and it doesn't leave a hole. The old microfilm, if it touched it, you just if you If you touch it, you would leave a little hole right there. Yeah. If it touched your hair uh, by accident, you know, you're flying and the plane flies over you and stalls and lands on your hair head, any place your hair touched it would, it would puncture it. So much of this was worked out in the 1930s and so we just keep refining it as time goes on. And oddly enough, a lot of the materials he's building with, um, you have rubber that you said was 20 years old, 15 years old, something like that? That is correct. Rubber is kind of like fine wine. Each month a new batch comes out and it has its own unique properties because it's a, a very specialized process for making that rubber. And as a result, you end up with this, this situation where people flock to certain batches of rubber. And so far, the ultimate batch was produced in May of 1999. Wow. So 599 rubber is the ticket. And what premium. makes that so special? It, it has a torque curve and an energy capacity that's higher than anything else that has been produced in terms of its usability. Mm -hmm. There's a new uh, formula for the rubber that came out a, a couple years back and it actually has a slightly higher energy capacity but it's in that top end those last few turns. Mm -hmm. Well in outdoor flying that works great because you can climb as high mm -hmm. as you want to. Climbing higher is better. Indoors you've got a ceiling to deal with so you want something with a flatter curve so you can use that, that power. So that it sort of tops 
drops off at the end. Exactly. So when we worry about KV motors and efficiency and amp draws and everything, you're worried about how the rubber twists when it's being wound up and how it twists mm -hmm. and the force you get when it's right. almost at the end of the... And we're looking at torque curves and, and optimizations and so on. <laughs> and in F1D it becomes yes. a whole different ball game because now we've got a variable pitch propeller that is designed to regulate the release of that energy. Amazing. Now people get in the hobby, obviously you can go from anywhere where you're entry level all the way up to where you're working a month on one ship. But for yes. someone wanting to get into this, uh, I'm guessing it probably towards the penny plane, right? That is exactly That's right. That's the entry level. What's something someone would need to go out and get? Uh, type of CA glues and all that stuff. You can pick up all of the balsa required to make this model at a hobby shop. Nice, so it's pretty, pretty simple yes. balsa. Yes, yes. The world repository of indoor free flight knowledge everything essentially that has ever been written about the topic is available at indoornewsandviews.com. It's been published for over 50 years. It is the ultimate source of knowledge. Is that where you'd also get like plans for this kind you of stuff? You would find all sorts of plans for every type of model that is on this table. Nice. Detailed notes, build tutorials, and so on going back into the, the early 1960s. You can actually follow the development of F1D. Uh, through nice. that magazine. That's where I interject an article written by Larry Koslick titled The Hobby Shopper Easy Bee. And it's found in the best of iNav in the uh, download section. And it will talk about wood testing. So I'm just going to push people towards that to get the right grades. But in essence, without too much regard for grade of wood, you can produce something that will fly. And that's where you want to start. You want a light, strong piece of wood for this motor stick. Everything else just kind of follows out from there. You need to be able to find decent 1 32nd inch balsa for the ribs, although if you can find light 1 16th, that'll work just fine for, for starting out. Uh, my first penny planes were built in almost entirely from 1 16th inch balsa and then a little bit heavier for the tail and the, the post and the And why motor do they sticks. call them penny planes? The original concept of Penny Plane was a beginner's class. So they said, well, what kind of, what will be a good marketing name for it? So they called it Penny Plane because pennies weighed 3.1 grams at the time. So they set that 3.1 gram minimum weight. Pennies now weigh 2.7 grams, so it's all confusing and so on. But the minimum weight for competition is 3.1 grams. 18 inch maximum wingspan, uh, 20 inch maximum length. Okay. So to get on to the covering material, uh, Ray Harlan, who runs Indoor Model Specialties, uh, is the, the best source for this thin film. And of course, if you go out and search for Super Ultra Film or yeah. uh, Polymicro, you'll, you'll be able to find something. And this is so exciting. I, I've been modeling for 30 plus years, and I've never seen one of these in real life. I've always watched YouTube videos. I've seen them back in the old days. We would read mm -hmm. Model Airplane News. Mm -hmm. And, and I've never got to actually see this, so this is certainly just a, a, a unique and just amazing thing. Now, your wonderful wife, and this is one thing I'm really excited about, uh, his wonderful wife, uh, there's a saying, you know, a family that plays together stays together. You two fly and build together. That is and correct. And I think that's exceptional that you do that. Uh, which plane is hers? This aircraft on the far outside wonderful. is one of Hope's models. It is an F1L, which is a, it's sort of a beginner's class. It's it's a step up, definitely from F1D. From penny plane. And that is a that is a state of the art F1L right there, as far as the the basic structure, airfoils, and, and so on. That's awesome. She rocks. She has learned how to form outlines and so on, form her own propellers and what have you. And that's that's really where the the step up comes into this yeah. this whole game of being able to make your own outlines and so on and get beyond the, the basic rectangles that are not as structurally strong. Wow. Now you mentioned like um, a, a formed propeller. I noticed this has, has kind of a, if, if I can touch this here. You can. This has actually a form to it and that's something that you do purposefully. And right. Can you, can you tell so me about So when you look at the, the blades on a radio controlled aircraft, you'll notice they're twisted and that's because the, each segment of the blade is traveling at a, di a different speed. So the lower the blade speed, the closer to the hub, the higher that angle needs to be to equal out to the same angle of attack as the blade tips further out. Okay. Now that's the simple description. It becomes <laughs> really crazy when you step I thought onto that was the, the higher level. description. <laughs> Thank you.
with this hobby, you know, you can fly in your living room here, but most likely you have to travel somewhere. And you That's can't exactly right. just walk out into the elements because uh, a little bit of wind goes a long way with these, right? If you sneezed on that, it would be done for. Yeah, and that's why I'm really trying not to sneeze right now. <laughs> um, but uh, you created a pretty awesome carrying case. And this is, as much as this hobby is an art, these have to be broken down and stored and transported to wherever you're going to fly. That box is actually sized so that carrier. I can take it on an airliner with me. And how many planes do you have in this box? I typically carry about 12 aircraft. About 12 there. aircraft in this little tiny thing. So not only are you engineering a plane to be able to fly at super slow speeds, get super long flight times, it also has to be able to be broken down and stored safely so you can travel and then reassemble. And all your adjustments are even, I, I see your elevator adjustments, you make these little tissue paper tubes. That's exactly right. You can change incidents. And he's doing that constantly. You're, you're constantly evaluating how it's flying, making adjustments. Yes, and, I'm and looking at its pitch attitude throughout the flight to, to optimize it so I can, I can slide these tubes up and down. Of course, I can completely remove nice. the, the surfaces for disassembly, and then I can adjust that angle. I, I can push it down a little bit. This one is pretty well set, so I've cut the, the okay. top of the post at the height that I want. But this tail post, I, I'm constantly tweaking whether I'm setting it up at a high pitch attitude. And that's going to change how the plane behaves, whether you're climbing if, more aggressive. Right. Or and of course, I'm playing with CG placement. Since this one came out a little bit underweight, I've got a little tiny piece of lead ballast back oh, here wow. to get my CG where I want it to be. A little bit of weight far away from the CG is a lot better than a lot of weight close to the CG. So you're using that advantage of distance, aren't you? Exactly. And that's why it's better to have your airplane come out nose heavy than tail heavy. Because it takes a lot of weight to get your CG forward because you've got these short noses. Okay. But it doesn't take a whole lot of weight to shove it way back out. These are called peanut scales, right? That's right. So how does this vary from this? I mean, obviously you can get more scale looks out yes. of that. And then also, I'm assuming these are probably quite a bit heavier. That's right. Can so this is 3.1 grams. Okay. This is about eight grams, so this is a oh, much heavier considerably model. Considerably it, it can be flown outdoors. It now, is actually. Keep, go ahead. Keep, I'm sorry. Keep in mind when he says this is about eight grams, it's heavy. It's still one what about one third of an ounce. That's right. Yeah. So so one third of one ounce. That is this heavy. makes this makes a vapor look like a fatty. This is a 13 inch wingspan, so that's the limits that are imposed by peanut scale rules. Okay. So that's pretty much what specifies it. This is an exact scale replica of a TMCA microplano from Mexico. So it was designed in World War One, and it was. A undergoing flight testing was about to go into production when the Mexican Civil War hit, and that pretty oh, much okay. ended TNCA. Gotcha. And so this aircraft just vanished into the sands of time. But because it has this nice square cross section and these simple lines, it's a great, great scale, scale model. Sure. So I liked it because I've got lots of scale data on it so I can get a, a, that fantastic accurate mm -hmm design. I built this from a Walt Mooney plan. Some of the Peck Polymers kits were designed by Walt Mooney. Okay. So he was the, the Professor Peanut, as they called him. Peanut scale was the thing that he did. Mm -hmm. And I took his plans, modified them slightly, and created this aircraft. I have scale rib placing and, and so on. Not so much in the tail. If you can see through the light there, I have very minimalist structure in here to get the weight down. So just to kind of recap a little bit, if someone wanted to get into this, do they make a kit that you can get started or is it leaning all towards scratch builds and plans? There is a lot of scratch building and so on, but Shorty's Basement, also uh, market mm -hmm. under the brand Volare, V-O-L-A-R-E okay. products, just search for that, you'll find it. Has a lot of short kits and full kits for scale models. They don't have the ultralight indoor stuff, okay. but I, I would actually recommend building one of their short kits, like the uh, the Phantom Flash from the 1930s. A great sure. little stick model. Hope rocks at building those and kicking nice. my rear with them. They're a good learning airplane, no bad habits. You can build that 
and that will pretty much give you the skill level you need to step on to the next level. Sure. Oh, well, cool. this has just been amazing. Friends, I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of the Flight Test family. And also, thank you for welcoming us into your home. Absolutely. To share this part of the hobby. This is something we've never even known about, we could never share with you. And wonderful <laughs> folks like Josh and Hope inviting us into their home uh, gives us an opportunity to share it with you. Let us know if you like this. Also, let us know what other elements you'd like to see within aviation. We'll do our best to bring it to you. Have a great day.